I think we can get started with the introduction. Do you hear me? Yep. Excellent. Well, so I am very happy today to welcome uh, the speaker of uh, the colloquium, Professor Jan Lekun, who is the vice president and chief AI scientist at Meta and the silver, silver professor at NYU affiliated with the Courant Institute and Center for Data Science. And he's also the founding director of Facebook AI Research and of the NYU Center of Data Science. Professor Lekun is one of the prominent figures in the field of AI, and he's a pioneer in deep learning. Um, Professor Lekun earned his PhD in computer science at Sorbonne Université in Paris. And after a postdoc in Toronto, he joined Bell Labs, where he became head of image processing research and joined NYU as a professor in 2003. And about a decade later, he became the director of AI research at Facebook. His research interests include AI and machine learning, computer perception, robotics, and computational neuroscience. He's known for his work on deep learning and the invention of the convolutional neural network method, which today is widely used in many fields. And he has many awards recognizing his work and is a member of the US National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Engineering, and the French Academy of Sciences. And it would take too long to list his awards, but I will just mention one of his most recent ones, the 2018 Turing Award, which he shared with Jeffrey Hinton and Joshua Benjo for conceptual and engineering breakthroughs that have made deep neural networks a critical component of computing. So today he will be telling us about a path towards human level intelligence, and we look forward to your talk. Welcome to the IFI, Jan Nekun. Thank you, Cora, for this nice introduction. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I met some of you before, um, at least uh, some. Let me uh, share my screen. This sentence, let me share my screen, is probably the most uh, pronounced sentence uh, ever over the last year anywhere in the world in various languages. And the second most frequent one is the second one I'm going to say is, uh, can you see my screen? <laughs> Can you see my slides? Okay, so a path towards human level AI. That seems like a very ambitious, over-ambitious, if not completely arrogant title. And uh, indeed it is. It is. So I'm, um, this is the kind of stuff you get to, uh, you get to say without being laughed out of the room uh, once you've uh, um, got a Turing Award. But you can laugh me out of the room if you, uh, if you feel like it. In fact, I would appreciate any critical comment about uh, what I'm, I'm going to say. So this is going to be more about like my research uh, program for the next several years uh, before my brain turns into white sauce. Uh, and uh, so it's meant to be sort of, you know, an inspiration for sort of new scientists and new researchers uh, in the science of intelligence and AI in particular. So uh, one big question I think that we need to solve uh, in AI, but not just in AI, uh, in sort of the understanding of intelligence in general, and uh, is, is how do humans and animals learn? And how can, we, uh, how can we get machines to learn in a similar way? Because this seems to be much more efficient than the, the kind of learning we're currently um, uh, you know, experiencing uh, uh, with, uh, with machines or we can reproduce with machines. Um, how is it that, uh, you know, babies in the first few months of life can learn uh, basically how the world works, mostly by observation? How is it that any teenager can learn to drive a car in about uh, 20 hours of practice with hardly any supervision? And we still don't have, you know, level five autonomous uh, cars uh, uh, today. So um, that's, I think, a big question that we should uh, answer. And, and this question is related to three challenges in AI, I think that are the main challenges. The first one is um, how do we get uh, uh, machines to learn to represent the world, but also to learn to predict what's going to happen in the world, because the ability to predict is uh, kind of the essence of intelligence. It allows you to plan, to figure out the consequences of your actions and things like that. So learning representations of the world and learning to predict what's going to happen in the world are two essential components of uh, a sort of an autonomous intelligence system that we need to be able to, um, to do. Um, and I've kind of uh, 
ended up focusing over the last several years on this concept of self-supervised journey, which I'll talk about at length. Uh, the second uh, big challenge is how do we get machines to reason? And I'm not saying necessarily, you know, logical reasoning or anything like this. You know, even uh, a dog reasons pretty well, you know, has uh, understanding of the physics of the world and can do some, uh, uh, some pretty complex reasoning. Um, and, you know, how do, how do we sort of uh, get machines that are first capable of running, but also capable of, uh, of reasoning? And the two are somewhat incompatible. So that um, uh, is a, a question we need to solve. And the third one is um, uh, the intelligence of, a, of an agent is reflected in how that, that agent can plan to act to satisfy a goal. And a complex goal has to be decomposed into sub goals. And that's called hierarchical planning. And we really don't know how to do this. We certainly don't know how to train machines to do this. Uh, but humans seem to be uh, able to do that pretty well. Um, so how do we solve those three problems? And I'm going to refer a, a path to a solution, not a solution, because the, the things I'm going to describe, some of which have been tried in certain contexts, but none of it has been sort of you know, implemented end to end, if you want. OK, so how do humans and animals learn uh, so quickly? And it's not using supervised neural reinforcement learning. It's using something else that we need to discover, which I call self-supervised learning. You can call it what you want. Um, so I stole this chart from Emmanuel Dupoux, who is a, a cognitive neuroscientist uh, in Paris and a cognitive psychologist. And he is trying to kind of figure out at what age uh, in months do human babies learn basic concepts like the, object, the, the notion of object permanence, the fact that when an object is hidden behind another one, it still exists, is going to reappear on the other side if you move your head. Uh, notions of uh, you know, dis distinguishing between animate and inanimate object that are, you know, arise around, around three months. Notion of stability and support. When you put an object on the table, is it going to stay put or is it going to fall? Um, when do sort of natural categories emerge in the, in the minds of babies? And then things like intuitive physics, the fact that when an object is not supported, uh, it's going to fall. So gravity, inertia, conservation of momentum, things like this. This is learned around the age of nine months. So for nine months, babies observe how the world works. And ar around nine months, they figure out that you know, objects follow predictable trajectories. How does that happen? Um, so uh, most of that happens mostly by observation. There is very little interaction that babies, babies cannot, you know, first few months, you know, hardly influence the world at all. They, they basically observe. So a lot of this is basically passive learning. And, and babies accumulate an enormous amount of background information about the world uh, in that period. Uh, it's completely non-linguistic. Um, it's not supervised. Um, there's hardly any reinforcement. But they do learn how the world works by, by observing the world go by. Um, how do we reproduce this kind of ability in machines? That's the, the big mystery. I think that, that you know, all of us interested in AI should be working on. Now, I know a lot of you are interested in applying deep learning and machine learning to things like, like you know, modeling physics and emergent phenomena and things like this. But I think actually it's a very connected question for reasons that will become clear, I hope, uh, later. So uh, a hypothesis I have, uh, which may be wrong, but it doesn't matter, is the fact that this accumulation of basic knowledge about how the world works constitutes the basis for what we call common sense. Uh, so I don't think uh, machines will be able to, hire, uh, to, to acquire common sense simply by reading books or you know, reading text. It needs to be grounded into some sort of reality, uh, which is a much richer, richer environment than uh, text. Uh, text is sort of very um, uh, discrete and approximate and, and, and poor, uh, low bandwidth. Um, and in fact, there's been some work before in, in, in psychology um, that claimed that common sense was basically a collection of models. Uh, it's not, you know, factual knowledge. It's kind of models that allows us to reason. Uh, this book by uh, Kenneth Craig from the 1940s. And I stole this from uh, my friend, Jitano um, So, So we have three paradigms of learning and machine learning today. We have uh, reinforcement learning. We have supervised learning, and we have this new undefined thing called self-supervised learning. And I would argue that self-supervised learning constitutes the bulk of uh, biological learning. And things like supervised uh, learning and reinforcement learning are basically kind of you know, thin slivers of thing on, things on top of uh, the bulk of learning, which is really uh, uh, you know, self-supervised. Uh, self um, <clears throat> 
so I, you know, I keep sort of bringing up this, this thing has become kind of a joke in the machine learning community a little bit. So um, what would be the architecture of a completely autonomous AI system, you know, of the type that we observe in animals, for example? Um, and there are certain components that I think uh, are, if not necessary, at least would be useful, uh, which are all kind of represented on this uh, small chart, roughly in the position where they actually reside in the in the in the human brain. So there's perception. So perception basically, you know, observes the sensor inputs and then extracts some sort of representation of the current state of the world, or at least a part of it that is being perceived. Um, uh, that is fed to uh, a world model and the role of the world model is to basically predict uh, what is going to happen um, because the world is evolving or because the agent is going to take some actions which may have an impact on the world, okay? So a world model is really a prediction of what's gonna happen in the future. And this occupies a big chunk of a prefrontal cortex in, in, in humans and many animals. Um, now this world model has an internal state, which is kind of a predicted state of the world, if you want, and that is being fed to a cost function. And that cost function uh, measures the, or evaluates the degree of, uh, uh, of incomfort of the agent, if you want. So when the cost is low or negative, the agent is, is happy. And when the cost is high, the agent is unhappy. That cost is divided into two sub-modules, one called an intrinsic cost, which is basically hardwired. So this is where the nature of the agent and its sort of basic behaviors are encoded. Um, th th this is written by hand, really. Um, you, you can think of it, or, or in humans, it's uh, designed into us by evolution for the survival of the species. Uh, so this determines the nature of the agent. And then there is another part to the cost, uh, which you could call a critic by analogy with a similar concept in reinforcement learning. And that the role of this is to basically predict ahead what the cost of a situation is going to be. So uh, you're facing a situation where you know, something is about to fall on you. Uh, you don't have to wait for this thing to fall on you. You can predict it's gonna fall and you kind of move out of the way because you know that the uh, ultimate uh, outcome is not gonna be good, right? So the critic basically predicts long-term values of the intrinsic cost, if you want. Uh, there's a short-term memory that you know, is there to store various things temporarily, but in particular, an estimate of the state of the world, perhaps combinations of states and uh, values of the cost. Um, this actor here is supposed to basically compute actions or action sequences that will uh, minimize the cost given the predictions given by the, by the world model. And there's this mysterious module at the top here, the configurator, and this is supposed to configure all of the different modules to solve the task at hand. So it sets sub goals and then it configures the other modules to solve that sub goal and then switches to another sub goal. Um, now, I don't exactly know how to build this uh, configurator, but, um, but it seems kind of a, a necessary uh, component. I'll come, I'll come back to this towards the end. Okay, so there's several ways to use this uh, type of uh, architecture. The first one is very simple. It's uh, basically a perception action loop where uh, the system um, acquires uh, uh, you know, sensor values, run them through an encoder. You know, think of this a uh, convolutional net or a transformer or something like that. Extracts some uh, representation of the state of the world, which may be somewhat abstract. Uh, computes the cost of that um, state, that um, estimated state, and feeds the state directly to uh, what's called a policy module that produces an action. So this is um, what I call mode one. Uh, by analogy with Daniel Kahneman's system one reasoning, where you this is the, the kind of task that you can execute without thinking about it, kind of you know in a subconscious manner, um, where you know you have a percept and you react to it uh, without having to sort of predict, you know, do any kind of reasoning, right? So very simple perception action loop. Uh, the second mode is more deliberate. So this one uses the world model um, as a predictor. So estimate the set of the world through the, this uh, uh, encoder, the perception module, and then uh, cycle through your, your world model by predicting the next state given a proposal for an action. This is just a proposal for an action. You're not actually taking the action. You're just imagining the action. Uh, as a consequence of this action, you're imagining the next state using your world model, and then you keep doing this. Uh, as a, you know, Imagine the sequence of actions. Imagine the result of the sequence of action using your predictive world model. Um, you can feed the predicted state of this world, world model into your cost function, and then by some optimization procedure, perhaps gradient descent of some kind, back prop through time in this case, uh, 
you can find an optimal sequence of actions that will minimize the cost. So this type of uh, reasoning is very classical in optimal control. It's called model predictive control. You use the prediction of your model of the world um, and, and of a cost function that you, are, you can compute yourself to basically uh, uh, compute an optimal sequence of action that will minimize your cost according to your prediction. Okay, again, very classical since the 1960s, basically. Uh, what is not classical here is that we're gonna learn the world model, okay? In a classical optimal control, the world model is, uh, is you know, written down essentially from first principles. Um, so once you've done this planning, you um, take the first action and send it to the predictor. So here, reasoning and planning are seen as the same thing, and they're seen as the process of minimizing some energy function, some cost with respect to the actions or the latent variables that, that, that you have. It's basically reduced to optimization. Reasoning is optimization, which you can think of as a way of doing constraint satisfaction. Um, now, there is a way to transfer a task that you know how to do using planning into a task that you will do subconsciously uh, uh, just reactively. And, and the way you do this is that you do this mode two reasoning where you run the, for, the, 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 the predictive model multiple time step, you uh, find a sequence of actions that minimize your cost, and then you use the uh, optimized, uh, optimal actions as targets to train a, a policy module, uh, some neural net that is meant to directly predict the optimal action from the state, okay? So if there is a way to predict the optimal action from the state, uh, a, a, a training procedure of that type will, will find it, okay? So what will happen here is that the system will initially, when it's faced with a new task, uh, will use its world model to imagine a plan and a sequence of actions. But as it repeats that task multiple times, it's gonna be able to train its policy module to basically just react uh, immediately to a, a percept without having to go through um, reasoning, essentially. Okay, so it transfers uh, mode two into mode one. And th this happens in humans, right? You, you learn to drive, you're very attentive, nobody can talk to you, you know, you can be distracted and you imagine all kinds of horrible scenarios. And then once, uh, you know, once you've practiced for a few dozen hours, you know, you basically do it subconsciously and you can talk to people at the same time and stuff like that. So, um, how is the cost module built? The cost module, as I said, is composed of two submodules, one that are called the intrinsic cost, which is hardwired and immutable, and the other one, uh, a critic or trainable cost. Um, and the, the overall cost is some linear combination of various submodules in those things, perhaps modulated by this configurator I was telling you about. Um, <clears throat> and the role of the trainable cost is to predict future values of the intrinsic cost from the current state. Uh, because you'd like to be able to anticipate whether an outcome is going to be good or bad uh, without, you know, having necessarily to sort of explicitly predict what's going to happen. You know, if you have a bad feeling about something, that means you have, you know, some impression something bad is going to happen not without necessarily having thought about it very, uh, very carefully. So that's the, the role of the critic here. Um, and the way you would train the critic is that you would have uh, some sort of uh, buffer memory, if you want short-term memory, where whenever the system... Uh, uh, observes the state of the world and computes the corresponding cost for the state of the world. It would store the, the triplet, you know, a timestamp, the state of the world and the corresponding intrinsic cost in the memory. And then later you can look at the content of that memory and then uh, recover the state, feed it to the critic module and then train the critic model module to predict a future value of the cost that you stored, uh, the, the intrinsic cost at some future time that you stored in that memory over the course of a sequence of actions, for example, right? So that's a way for the critic to basically train itself to predict future outcomes uh, of uh, a sequence of actions. Okay, but then we come to the crux of the matter here, which is really how do we build and train the world model, which I think is really the, the, the main question we need to solve in, in all of this. Um, and I'm going to argue for two things. One is energy-based models, which is basically an argument for throwing away probabilistic modeling. And I'm sure there are many physicists in the audience and that a lot of what I'm gonna say is gonna be very familiar to you. And the second one is joint embedding architectures and that will be arguing for throwing away generative models. Okay, so I'm going to basically tell you that two of the pillars 
of machine learning, probabilistic modeling, and generative models have to be thrown away. Okay, and I imagine uh, that might require a little bit of uh, convincing. So, um, uh, why energy-based models? So, the world is stochastic. Uh, perhaps it's stochastic because um, it's inherently stochastic because it's you know um, chaotic or you know noisy. Uh, or perhaps it's deterministic, but not predictable, okay? If you believe quantum mechanics, um, you might believe that the world is actually completely deterministic, but unpredictable, at least not with uh, a computer that's contained in the same universe you're doing prediction in. So um, that comes down to the same thing, which is that there is some unpredictability about the world. So if I give you a segment of video X and I ask you to predict what's gonna happen next in that video, there are many plausible ways to continue a single video that depends on a lot of things that you just cannot possibly observe. Okay, so I put a pen on the table and I let it go. Uh, every time I repeat the experiment, the pen is likely to fall in a different direction. Here's the same video in loop, so it always falls in the same direction. But in fact, uh, the direction may be uh, you know, unpredictable. And so if I force a system to make a single prediction, it's gonna to have to predict, and, and for example, if the cost is least square, uh, it's gonna to have to predict the average of all the possible outcomes. And that's a bad prediction uh, because in a high dimensional space like images, the, the space of possible outcomes is some sort of complex manifold. If you compute the average, it's not on the manifold. So uh, it's not a good thing. Uh, you have to have a model that can predict multiple things. And one way to do this is, is um, uh, and and you know if if you if you try to coerce a, a model into uh, predicting videos, for example, a model that is only able to make a single prediction, what you get is prediction that looks like the this where they are very blurry, or they look like the second column here on the video at the bottom where the predictions of so this is a a top down view of some highway and those those blue uh, rectangles are cars. Uh, and what you're trying to do here with this model is predicting where the cars around you are going are going to go. Uh, let me repeat this video. And this model here um, can only make one prediction. And as a consequence, it makes blurry prediction, which are the average of all the possible trajectories that the, the cars around, uh, around it can, uh, can follow. Um, if you're smart about it, if you have a latent variable model, for example, uh, you can make crisp predictions. So the, the four predictions you see here are not blurry and they're all different. And they're different because there is uh, a model that predicts them that has a latent variable that you can draw from uh, a distribution. And depending on what you draw, the, the, the prediction will be different. Um, <clears throat> so that's one way um, to kind of handle uncertainty, have a latent variable model. The other way to handle uncertainty is what I call joint embedding predictive architectures, which I'll explain in a second. Um, but before that, I need to explain what uh, self-supervised learning is really all about. So self-supervised learning an, a good example of self-supervised learning is predicting the future uh, in video, in text, in whatever, okay? So um, I give you a piece of video and ask you to continue it, um, complete the rest of the video. But basically self-supervised learning more generally is just filling in the blanks. You have uh, an observation, which may be partial and you ask the system to complete the observation, okay? You have missing frames in the video, missing words in the, in the text. Um, uh, you only see the, you know, one half of, uh, of, a, of an object and you might need to predict the other half uh, or things like that. Um, and the, the self-supervised learning consists in training a system to make uh, either to predict what's gonna happen, uh, you know, how to fill in the blanks or simply to capture the dependency between the parts that are observed and the parts that are not yet observed will eventually be observed without actually attempting to predict them. Um, this can be used for a number of different things. It can be used to learn hierarchical representations of the world, as I will show uh, later. But it can also be used to learn predictive forward models of the world that you can use to plan uh, as part of this architecture I was telling you about. So how do we represent uncertainty and multimodality in the prediction? And there we need uh, this concept of energy-based models, which I've, I've talked about for many years. Uh, and it's uh, basically a way to weaken the, the sort of classical way of handling uncertainty in machine learning and statistics, which is to use probabilistic modeling uh, in such a way that you can apply uh, uh, sort of, you know, uncertainty handling to situations where the, the, uh, the variable you're trying to capture the dependency of is high dimensional and continuous. And as many uh, statistical physicists know, uh, that leads to 
intractability in the partition function. So basically, uh, the, the argument for this energy-based model uh, concept is to avoid the problem of having to deal with an part intractable partition function. So it's a very sort of physical uh, or physics-related uh, re uh, reason. So what I'm proposing to do here is instead of predicting y from x using a parameterized function like a neural net, I'm going to use a neural net uh, as an architecture that predicts a single scalar value, um, which I'll call an energy. Uh, and that scalar value measures the incompatibility between X and Y. So you propose it an X and a Y, and the energy function tells you whether this X and a Y are compatible. Gives you a segment of video X, and then uh, a continuation for that video. It gives you a low energy because it's a good continuation. If you give it a video and then an implausible continuation of that video, it'll, it'll give you a high energy because it's implausible, right? So the advantage, so basically you can think of this as an implicit function, right, of that relates the dependencies between, uh, encodes the dependency between X and Y. So what it allows you to do is that it allows you to make multiple predictions of Y for, from a given X, right? Here for a given value of X, if X is a scalar in this case, I can have multiple values of Y that have low energy represented by this uh, kind of bluish uh, area. Uh, imagine that those black dots are data points, training samples that I observe, okay? And to train this energy-based model, I need to basically train so network that computes this energy function to give low energy to stuff I observe and higher energy to stuff I do not observe. Uh, so basically give low energy to the manifold of data where the data come from and then higher energy outside, okay? Um, that's what an energy-based model is. Um, now you can do inference in an energy-based model. So if I give you an X and I ask you to predict Y, you can do this, but it may not be easy because it may, it may require to find the minimum of f of x, y, uh, you know, where x is fixed and, and you find a y or multiple y's that minimize this uh, energy function. This may or may not be possible. Uh, if you want to generate stuff, predict stuff from this model, then you need to make this possible, but uh, it may be impossible or it may be very difficult. And there may be many uh, y's that, uh, you know, minimize this, uh, this function, in fact, an infinity possibly. Uh, you may have multiple energy functions that basically capture the same dependency between X and Y. So here the dependency between X and Y is something like, you know, Y equals X squared or something like that, you know, some parabola. Uh, and those two energy functions uh, from the point of view of uh, capturing the dependency are completely equivalent. Uh, from the point of view of probabilistic inference, they're not, but we'll come to this in a second. So the two forms of energy-based models, conditional and unconditional. The conditional ones are those in which you have an X variable, which is always observed and you capture the dependency of uh, variable y on x, y may or may not be observed. It's, it's observed during training. It may be partially observed during uh, uh, a test. And then the unconditional version, you don't have an x, you just have a y, and you're trying to sort of uh, model the internal consistency of y, right? So y could be, for example, an image, and uh, uh, you could train the model to give you low energy for you know, high quality, clean, noiseless images. And, uh, and high energy for noisy images or things that don't look natural or things like that, right? So you could use something like this for image reconstruction or something of that type. Okay, you can uh, often turn an energy-based model into a probabilistic model uh, using a gibbs boltzmann distribution. And uh, this is probably one of the few audiences uh, to whom I don't need to explain what a gibbs boltzmann distribution is. So P of Y given X, would be e to the minus beta, some uh, inverse temperature uh, positive constant, uh, f of xy, and then you divide by the integral of this over y uh, so that you normalize your, your, your probability distribution uh, is normalized uh, with respect to y. You know, we, you integrate the top with respect to y, you get one, okay? Um, so very easy. The thing is, you may not be able to do this because this integral at the bottom here may turn out to be intractable, may, turn out to not converge. It could be that your energy function is such that this integral does not converge, okay? So that is the argument for abandoning probabilistic modeling and basically just sticking with F. Forget about P, just use F. Um, now, most uh, energy-based models are actually, um, uh, you know, represented by this F of XY. Uh, and f of xy, I call it f because it's actually a free energy. Uh, you could think of it that, that, like that. Very often, the actual energy depends on some latent variable z. And what you have to do is basically minimize the energy with respect to z, this latent variable. Uh, 
so that you eliminate the dependency on Z and now you have uh, uh, an energy function that only depends on, on X and Y. So Z would be some sort of latent variable that is never observed and you just eliminate it by minimizing over it. Uh, if you're a Bayesian, you want to marginalize over it, but for now we'll just stick with minimizing. Um, anyway, this is just a, a statement to say that you can uh, reduce latent variable energy-based models to regular energy-based models. Um, and you know, examples of uh, latent variable energy-based models are things like uh, like k-means uh, clustering. You can think of it in terms of an energy-based model whose energy is basically the square reconstruction error, and the uh, the latent variable is a, a one-hot vector that selects which prototype uh, the, the Y is, is closest to. Uh, sparse coding is another example where here you have a, a regularizer on the latent variable uh, where you know the latent variable is a vector that you multiply by some dictionary matrix and you can uh, sort of reconstruct the input. The energy is the square reconstruction error plus another term that indicates essentially counts how many terms in the, how many components in Z are non-zero. Those are, completely in interpretable in terms of energy-based models with latent variable that are unconditional. Um, okay, now we come to the interesting question is how do we train uh, energy-based models? Uh, because if we train a probabilistic model, there's an easy way to train them, which is, you know, you use a loss function that basically corresponds to uh, maximum likelihood. You know, train your system so that the parameters uh, are found that gives the largest likelihood to the training samples you're observing. With an energy-based model, you know, we can't rely on, on, on that. So uh, what are the principles that we have to use? Uh, and just that is more general than probabilistic approaches. So there's two methods, contrastive methods and regularized or architectural methods. So here's the problem that we need to solve when we train energy-based models. Um, we want to give low energy to our training samples, which are those white uh, uh, spheres, okay? Those white, white dots. So it's very easy to, you know, build a neural net who has a single output, the energy, right? And uh, we give it a training sample and then we tweak the weight so that the energy goes down. Very easy, right? So easy to make the energy of the training sample small. The main question is how do we make the energy of anything outside the manifold of uh, training data higher? Because if you want our model to capture the dependencies between the, the variables, we need to give low energy to stuff we observe, but we need to give high energy to stuff we don't observe, okay? So if we're not careful, if we're just merely uh, pushing down the energy of the stuff we observe, we run the risk of a collapse, which means, um, <clears throat> so a collapse in this case is the, the fact that the energy surface is gonna basically be flat and is not going to capture the dependency between X and Y. Um, so we have two approaches. One is contrastive methods. So the contrastive method essentially uh, generate those green contrastive points whose energy is gonna be pushed up, okay? So the energy surface is gonna take the right shape because we're gonna push down on the data points and then we're gonna generate fake data points and we're gonna push up their energy. And so hopefully the energy surface is gonna take the right shape. An alternative is to build the architecture of the energy system in such a way that by construction, it can only give low energy to kind of a small sliver of input space which is the example I'm showing here. We force the sliver of uh, space to, to be one dimensional that, that can take low energy or um, have some way of uh, minimizing the volume of space that can, that, is, that can take low energy, okay? So um, let me go through a couple architectures and, and tell you to what extent they can collapse or not. So a traditional architecture that does, just does prediction, a generative model, if you want, um, has you know, an observation X, you run it through a neural net, you run it through a predictor, and then you measure the energy as the prediction error with the uh, variable you want to, to predict. And this will not collapse because this system can give low energy to only one point. For a given X, it will produce one prediction uh, Y tilde. And so that point will have a low energy, everything else will have higher energy, so it cannot collapse, okay? But it cannot do multimodal prediction either. So, no, not so interesting. Now, this is probabilistic uh, generative modeling or non-probabilistic generative uh, model where you run through an encoder, you have a predictor, but the, predi the predictor now depends on the latent variable, which can vary over a set or draw from a distribution. So as a consequence of varying this latent variable, the prediction will vary over a set or span some sort of you know, distribution. Um, and so that allows for multimodal prediction. Um, 
And this model, unfortunately, can collapse. If, um, if I have a latent variable here that is as um, um, powerful, if you want, as high, let's say it's a vector with the same dimension as y, uh, there's always going to be a value of z that when I run into the predictor is going to produce the y I'm observing, unless the predictor is degenerate. But let's assume the predictor is not degenerate. For any value of y, any pair of xy I give to the system, there's always going to be a value of z that's going to uh, give me a zero prediction energy, which means my system is going to collapse. It's going to have a flat energy surface that gives zero energy to everything. Uh, not a good thing. The way to fix this is to restrict the domain that Z can span. Uh, in other words, we, uh, minimize the volume of space that Z can occupy so that the volume of space that the prediction can occupy is also minimized. And therefore the volume of space that my model gives low energy to is also minimized, okay? Um, so you need to regularize those latent variable models. Uh, all, predicted, all probabilistic models have some regularization of the latent variable. Um, then you have autoencoders, and autoencoders are so you have an encoder, and then you run into a decoder, and your energy is a reconstruction error. And those can also collapse because you cannot, uh, unless you take you know, specific measures, that uh, autoencoder can uh, basically learn the identity function from input to, uh, to output. So you feed it a y, and then the encoder decoder function is just the identity function. It always reproduces the y you feed it, and therefore the energy surface is flat, it's zero everywhere. Not a good model either of the internal dependencies of Y. So you have to somehow have a way of preventing an autoencoder from computing the identity function. You want it to reconstruct the stuff you train it on. You want it to not reconstruct the stuff you don't train it on. And that's the hard part. Um, then there is the joint embedding architecture. And this is what I'm, I'll be focusing on later. It can collapse as well. So here you take both X and Y and you run them both through encoders. And then you, uh, you basically try to predict SY from SX or you try to make SY and SX equal. Um, and this can easily collapse by basically what the system would do is that it would set SX and XY to constant values, completely ignoring X and Y. And now your prediction error is zero all the time. Collapse model again. So our main question is gonna be, how do we prevent our model from collapsing? And the answer depends on the architecture, which is why I went through this. But essentially there are two classes of methods Contrastive methods, as I explained earlier, where, uh, you know, let's say we start with a region of low energy that has this shape, okay? And our data points are those uh, blue, blue, blue beads. So this energy model is not very good because it gives low energy to regions that don't, uh, doesn't have data. And it gives high energy to a region where we have data, right? So we need to adjust it. So one way to adjust it is that, you know, we keep pushing down on the energy of points where we have data. For those of you who remember uh, Hopfield Nets, that's, what half your nets do. And then we have uh, other points, those green points, and we're gonna generate them somehow and we're gonna push their energy up, okay? So we're gonna plug the energy of green points and blue points in a loss function. And the role of this loss function would be to push down on the, on the energy of blue points and push up uh, on the energy of green points. Loss function is what learning is minimized. The energy function is what inference minimizes, okay? Now, for those of you who remember Boltzmann machines, Boltzmann, Boltzmann machines are an example of contrastive methods. But contrastive methods are pervasive. Now, I'm going to argue against contrastive methods because they don't scale very well with dimension. If the dimension of Y is, is high, the, the volume of space in which you're gonna to have to place those green points uh, grows exponentially with dimension. And this is not gonna scale very well if you want to learn high dimensional representations that contain a lot of information about the input. And so um, I think contrastive methods are essentially doomed. And I'm going to argue for regularized methods. So methods where you have a term in the loss or in the energy, but mostly in the loss that essentially tries to minimize the volume of Y space that can take low energy for a given X. Okay, so it's got some sort of you know, term that is an approximate measure of the volume occupied by low energy space, uh, uh, low energy uh, areas, and you try to kind of minimize that. And the question is, how do we do this? Okay. So contrastive methods uh, are very popular at the moment for a lot of applications. Uh, most uh, uh, probabilistic modeling methods that are used uh, for like you know maximum likelihood probabilistic modeling are contrastive in some way. Uh, uh, using maximum likelihood. But here is a list of uh, uh, a lot of methods, uh, machine learning or statistical estimation methods uh, 
uh, uh, classified as to whether they are contrastive or regularized or architectural. Um, and the contrastive methods that differ by how you pick those green points and what loss function you use once you have a bunch of green points and blue points, okay? So maximum likelihood uh, when you use uh, Monte Carlo, Marco Chen Monte Carlo or, or hybrid um, Hamilton and Monte Carlo methods um, are basically contrastive methods. The samples you get from your Monte Carlo method are the green, the green dots. Uh, contrastive divergence, metric learning with Siamese networks, uh, ratio matching, NCE, uh, adversarial uh, networks like GANs, all, those are all uh, contrastive methods. Things like, uh, you know, are sort of, you know, people have been really excited about in recent years, like denoising autoencoders and masked autoencoders, things that are used to train birth style systems for natural language processing, for example, or, or, or language models. Those are all contrastive methods. Um, and then in regularized methods, there are things like PCA, K means, Gaussian mixture model, square ICA, normalizing flows, uh, sparse coding, sparse autoencoders, VAE, variational autoencoders. Uh, contracting autoencoders, Suave, BYOL, Barlow Twins, VicRag. I'm going to focus on VicRag because I think it's, uh, so it's a recent paper uh, from uh, 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 me and my collaborators, some of my collaborators, uh, which is kind of a follow-up on this thing, Barlow Twins, and it's a non-contrastive method for joint embedding architectures. Um, so for contrastive method, there is a, a whole menagerie of loss functions you can use. Uh, people tend to like the you know, uh, some sort of log likelihood uh, type function. Sometimes they call this info NCE, but it's really uh, log likelihood. Uh, and, you know, various other things. I'm not gonna go through this laundry list, but just to tell you that there is a whole menagerie of them. And I'm going to say, you know, you don't want to use, you don't want to use any of them. I invented a whole bunch of those. I even invented contrastive methods for joint embedding, but um, I don't think they, I think, I think their future is bleak. Uh, this is the one, the, the, the most popular at the moment, um, uh, info NCE, and it's basically a log likelihood. Um, so you're basically trying to make the uh, energy of uh, a pair of compatible X and Y small. And then you take a bunch of pairs of incompatible X and Ys that you have to somehow generate. You can pick them from your training set. And, uh, and then you, you know, put that at a denom denominator and then take minus log and minimize that as a loss function with respect to the parameters of your energy function. Um, so uh, I'm going to argue also that maximum likelihood is actually a bad objective function to minimize. Um, so as I said, you can turn an energy model into a, a conditional likelihood model. Uh, and uh, if you want to do maximum likelihood, you end up with this loss function, which is just, just a negative log of, of this one at the top divided by beta, where the, this term here says, I want to make the energy of my training sample as small as possible. And that other term says, I'm going to push up on the energies of all the values of y in proportion to how much uh, probability my model gives to it. In fact, when you compute the gradient of this, you get the gradient of the energy function with respect to the parameters at the training sample. And then the negative term uh, is sort of a expected value of a gradient. So it's the gradient of the energy at various points, uh, Y prime integrated over uh, the, the whole set of Y prime uh, and then uh, weighted by the probability that your model gives to this Y prime. Um, so that's explicitly a contrastive method. Of course, this is intractable, so we approximate this using Monte Carlo or Marco Monte Carlo or something like that. But in the end, what it comes down to is that you get a sample from your Monte Carlo method, and then you plug that into this loss function, and what you get is that your weight should be changed by the difference in the gradients of the energy of the good guy minus the energy of the bad guy. All right, uh, straightforward. It's a bad idea. It's a bad idea because it pushes the energy of bad guys to infinity, and it pushes the energy of good guys to you know, as low as they can go, usually the energy has a low, low, lower bound. Um, and what you end up with, if, uh, if you're not careful, is an energy surface that is basically a very deep canyon, uh, very narrow if your uh, input distribution is kind of a, a thin manifold. This is a very bad energy to use. You can't use it to do inference because it doesn't have any useful gradient. Okay, so maximum likelihood, likelihood is bad. Um, so again, you know, uh, I imagine some people will have a hard time being convinced that we have to draw up probabilistic modeling, but I'm arguing for that. Uh, uh, so GANs are an example of contrastive method where basically the, the generator is viewed as a smart way of generating those, those, blue dot, those, those green dots that, whose energy we're gonna push up, where we view the discriminator as an energy uh, function essentially. 
Um, denosing autoencoders and mask autoencoders, but style uh, can be viewed also in the context of energy-based model, but I'm not, I'm not gonna go into the details of that. So what architectures can we use uh, to, to build those, uh, uh, those predictors? So we can, um, you know, I've talked about the joint embedding architecture here, where you take X, you take Y, you run them through uh, encoders, which may or may not be identical. And then you compare the two output vectors and you, you know, basically measure the distance between those vectors in some ways, and that's your energy function. And you want to make the energy for training samples low and the energy for everything else higher. Um, a, a slightly uh, a better architecture that allows you to make prediction, let's say over time, is you give, uh, you know, an X, uh, like say a video clip, and then you give uh, the, the continuation of that video clip, and you train the system to encode both clips using a representation of SX and XY, and then predict the representation of Y from the representation of X by minimizing a prediction error through a predictor. Now that works for deterministic prediction, but if the prediction needs to be multimodal, so if you, if you need to have multiple possible predictions for a given observation, then you need a, a latent variable here that uh, goes to this deterministic function here, the predictor, so that when you, when you vary the latent variable, the prediction will vary accordingly. Um, so that's kind of uh, this architecture I call the joint embedding predictive architecture or JEPA. Uh, and this is, I think, the thing that we should use in the future for modeling uh, uh, phenomena, uh, including physical phenomena, okay? So this architecture does not allow you to predict because uh, to predict a Y from an X, you would need to invert this encoding function and that encoding function may not be uh, injective. Okay, there may be multiple Ys that map to a single SY. And so it may be very difficult to invert this, but this is, so you, you could think of this as a, as, as a downside, but it's actually an advantage because it means that now you can have a whole collection of Y that has the same energy for a given X um, by basically training the encoder to eliminate the details, you know, the, the variations of Y within the set. Uh, the other way you can make the prediction multimodal is through the is through the latent variable. So you have two ways here to represent multimodal prediction. One is through invariant prop invariance properties of the encoder. The other one through the latent variable in the predictor. So that's the thing: the joint embedding predictive architecture, um, and um, <clears throat> uh, it has this big advantage: is that uh, it doesn't need to predict every detail of y. So let's say I'm using a predictive model. Uh, in, the con in the context of a self-driving car. Um, so the self-driving car would like to predict what the cars around it are going to do uh, to be able to drive defensively, for example, or plan a trajectory around the, the other cars, uh, see if it can fit you know, between other cars and change lane or something like that, right? So there are details about the scene that you may want to be able to predict, like you know, are cars around you going to accelerate, brake, you know, turn left or right, things like that. Um, and there are things that are completely irrelevant. You know, bordering the road are trees and there is wind and the leaves of the trees are moving in the wind. And if you had a generative model, your generative model will have to devote a huge amount of resources just to predict the, the variations, you know, the fluctuations of those uh, leaves in the trees, which are completely irrelevant to the task and essentially impossible to predict. So you'd like a system to be able to uh, eliminate the details that are either uh, irrelevant to the task but you may not know which ones they are, which ones they are. But certainly, you want to eliminate the details that are unpredictable. Things like leaves in the tree, things like individual motions of molecules in a gas, right? Uh, so things that you just cannot possibly uh, use uh, for for prediction. Um, and so that's the big advantage of this architecture, which is that it can learn to uh, choose representations to learn representations that. Uh, you know, contain as much information as possible about the input, but also uh, are predictable from each other. And that's the kind of criterion we're going to use to train those. So uh, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, contrastive methods are, you know, somewhat popular today for training joint embedding architectures. And this goes back a long time to a paper I, I, I wrote um, with my coworkers at Bell Labs in the early 90s. Uh, there's more recent paper from my lab at uh, NYU, and then, you know, a flurry of new papers since uh, the mid uh, uh, 2010s. Um, many of them from actually from my colleagues at FAIR, this one from Google, um, which is basically contrastive methods to train those uh, joint embedding architectures. Uh, so you feed them with uh, pairs of, you know, essentially identical images or two images that are different views of the same scene, if you want, or distorted version of the same image. 
uh, and you force the system to produce uh, uh, similar output vectors for, for those two images. And then you also present it with different images and then you push those two vectors away from each other. Um, so um, once you've trained the system to do this, you can uh, use uh, an internal representation learned by the, by the neural net. You plug a classifier on, on top that you train in supervised mode and you can uh, measure how good the representation is here by measuring how good this classifier uh, is on some image recognition task of some kind. So this works really well with info NCE. Uh, it's a contrastive method. There's been large scale experiment done by some of my colleagues at, uh, at FAIR, uh, training on 1 billion random images from Instagram, for example, and getting really good results on ImageNet. Uh, people have used this at, at FAIR for uh, speech recognition. You can train a very accurate speech recognition system with only 10 minutes of labeled speech, which is kind of amazing. After you've pre-trained it using self-supervised method uh, of the type I, I just showed, uh, translation system can be trained this way. Um, but really the cool stuff is, uh, is, is, is regularized methods. Um, so this is where uh, you know, things become uh, more interesting. Um, so the idea here is uh, you, you, you run, again, uh, this is a JEPA architecture. You run X through an encoder and you run Y through an encoder. They may or may not be identical, doesn't matter. And then you have a criterion here, which basically attempts to maximize the information content that SX has on X. Okay, so basically find a way here to make sure that SX is informative about X. Uh, and there is no single way to do this. You have to make some assumptions to be able to do that about the distribution of uh, SX, for example. Okay, so that's one criterion. You apply it on both sides. You have a, a third criterion, which is that you minimize the prediction error. Okay, and you have a third criterion. If you have a latent variable in your predictor, you have to minimize the information content of the latent variable, otherwise the system will collapse, right? So those three terms, information maximization of SX and XY and information minimization of Z are there to prevent collapse. And then D will actually drive, you know, drive the system to collapse, which is kind of funny. Uh, so how, how do we do this in practice? Like, you know, what is an instantiation of this? Um, so there's various uh, things that have been proposed uh, in, in, you know, last year or two. Uh, to do this, uh, Barlow Twins and Vic Craig are out of my group at FAIR. Uh, BYOL is from DeepMind, and WMSC is from a group uh, in France. And uh, basically, I'm going to talk about Vic Craig here. Um, the way you maximize the information content of SX, uh, approximately, is that you take the SX vector, you run it through a neural net with a few layers, and the role of this neural net is to expand the dimension. Okay, so you go typically SX will have dimension 2000, and VX will have dimension 8000 or something like that. Then you apply two criteria on the components of uh, VX. The first criterion is that you apply a hinge loss on the standard deviation of, uh, of uh, each component of VX over a batch. Okay, so you take a batch, take one component of VX, uh, measure the standard deviation over that, and then plug this into a hinge loss so that the standard deviation is at least uh, above a certain threshold, in this case, one. Okay, so this is the the positive part of one minus the, 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 the standard deviation. So that makes the standard deviation larger than one, essentially. You do this for every component of SX, you do it, or VX, you do this also for every component of VY. Um, and then you have a second criterion, which is a covariance criterion. You measure the covariance. So the, the sum of the product of the activities of two components of VX, okay? And you try to make this as close to zero as possible, minimize the square or something like that of diagonal terms, right? So basically what you're trying to do with this combination of two terms is that you're trying to make the covariance matrix of VX over a batch as close to possible, as close as possible to the identity matrix. Um, and that indirectly sort of maintains the information content uh, of VX under certain assumptions. Uh, the assumptions being that the dependencies between the components of uh, VX are not too complicated. Uh, so that correlation basically measures dependency. Uh, now, why have more components in VX than you have in SX? It's because by decorrelating the components of VX, uh, since the VXs are nonlinear functions of the SX through a neural net, it will have the effect of making the components of SX mutually independent. Not completely, but somewhat, okay? Uh, and it's kind of hand wavy argument I'm giving you because that's what I have. But that's, the, that's basically what we are uh, shooting for here. And experimentally, it works better when VX has a higher dimension than SX. Uh, 
Okay, uh, so this this is the the so variant uh, vcreg means variance invariance covariance regularization. And what I've shown you here is the variance and covariance term, and the invariance term is this one. It's the one that says the prediction for the representation of SY from SX should be as close to SY as possible. Okay, that's the invariance. Or I should say equivariance if we allow from uh, for some variations. Uh, uh, our X here is a regularizer that will minimize the information content of the latent variable to prevent the type of collapse I was talking about earlier. Okay, so this is the basic idea of VCRAG. Uh, I'm not gonna bore you with details, but it works really well in the sense that when you use uh, the VCRAG method to pre-train a convolutional net to represent images and the X and Y are basically um, distorted versions of the same training sample if you want from ImageNet. And then you chop off the last, the, you chop off the expander you plug a linear classifier on top and you train this linear classifier on ImageNet to measure the performance. Um, it works really well, as well as any other uh, self-supervised running method if you do it in the same conditions. So um, this works and it's really good, good because unlike the other method, it's, it's very general. It can be applied to situations where the two encoders are different, um, where you don't have uh, uh, shared waste between them. It doesn't require to use uh, sort of any tricks like batch normalization and things like this that um, uh, you know, tend to be required for other methods like BYOL. Uh, so I'm not gonna you know, go into the, all, all of those details, but uh, here's an, um, another big advantage. And the advantage of the JEPA architectures is that not only can you use them to learn uh, representations of uh, things like images or other data, you can also use them as the basis of a predictive model for a, an autonomous intelligent system. And you would probably use a hierarchical version of it. Um, so this is a, a JPA architecture here, and it may do perform predictions in sort of a low level abstract space. Okay, um, S uh, of zero here, or S1, uh, uh, the first level. So if you keep a lot of details about the, about the state of the world, you can only make predictions that are in the short term because it's very likely, the more detail you have, the more likely it is that the details cannot be predicted very accurately. So low level representations will allow for short term predictions. But what you can do is you can stack those architectures because the prediction is performed in abstract space, both on, the, on, 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 on that side and on, on the prediction side. Uh, you can stack another level on top, another encoder that will produce an even more abstract representation of the state of the world that has even fewer details. And with that, you can make longer term predictions that are um, accurate, okay? So if I wanna go from here to Boston, um, uh, you know, I can predict that if I take the train, I'll be, I'll be in Boston in you know, about four hours. Uh, I don't need to know the details of the timing of trains and anything, you know, it'll take you know, between four and five hours, you know, something like that. Um, and then, you know, I can decompose this into sort of uh, lower level uh, conditions like, you know, I need to go to the station and catch the train. And then once I'm in the train station in Boston I take a taxi to MIT or Harvard or whatever. Uh, and then I can decompose this uh, further uh, to get to the station in New York. I need to get out of this building and then take the subway or to get out of the building. I need to uh, stand up and walk, walk out the door and go to the elevator to get out of my chair. I need to stand up, but that requires having millisecond by millisecond muscle control. So you might imagine that uh, I might have some sort of hierarchical decomposition of a complex task into subtasks. And this is really the purpose of this here. So the, the, the sort of hierarchical mode two, if you want, based on this uh, hierarchical JEPA architecture that we would use as the basis of our world model. Um, we take a, a estimate of the state of the world, um, at the first level, we run it through a second encoder that gives us a high level representation of the world, uh, which tells me, uh, you know, I'm at NYU, I need to go to Boston. The cost function here is my distance to MIT. Um, you know, I need to get to the to Penn Station and then catch a train. And then once I'm arrived, I need to, you know, get a taxi to uh, MIT, Harvard Square or whatever. <clears throat> uh, and then, you know, I could decompose this into a set of conditions that my state has to satisfy, or, you know, you can think of them as uh, high level actions that will determine uh, cost functions for the lower level, where, you know, going to the to, uh, Penn Station will require me to get out of the building and catch a, uh, uh, catch a subway, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to 
low level muscle control. So that's kind of the overall plan. You can handle uncertainty here with latent variables that account for the fact that you cannot make exact predictions in the world. So I'm coming to the, coming to the end here, which uh, is a good thing because I'm completely out of time. Um, so, you know, self-supervised learning will allow us to learn representations of the world and learn uh, predictive models of the world. To handle uncertainty in the prediction, we need to use joint embedding predictive architectures understood within the energy-based model framework. Uh, learning world model from observation, like human uh, and animal babies, is possible, I think, by just, you know, uh, training one of those predictive models by watching video, essentially, uh, and, and then by, you know, you know observing uh, results from actions. And then reasoning and planning uh, come down to uh, essentially minimizing energy function with respect to uh, uh, action sequences or sequences of latent variables. And so that is compatible with gradient-based learning, which is like, you know, a big, uh, big condition that needs to be satisfied. Now, I haven't really spoken very much about the configurator here because I don't really know how to build it, but basically the role of it would be to configure all the other modules for the current task at hand. Uh, maybe provide executive control, set sub goals, prime the perception module and, the, uh, and, and other modules for the task at hand, configure the world model for the task at hand um, because we only have a single world model engine. Um, and, and, you know, basically make the, the system sort of focus on deliberate conscious task. And that's it. Thank you very much. Let's unmute ourselves to give a round of applause to Jan Lecun for a very uh, interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. And I will take questions. Please raise your virtual hands for questions. Uh, Hector. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. I am not an expert on, on this topic and uh, that I could follow most of it. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, just a, a quick question. Uh, you mentioned the hierarchical planning at the end. Um, some of the, the uh, at a very high level, uh, remind me a little bit of the HDQN architecture by um, uh, by Tenenbaum and students. Then I do you are you aware of that architecture? And I wanted the relation versus yeah. this one. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's a lot of things that I talk about here that uh, Josh has been talking about for a while as well. So, I mean, to some extent, this is really connected to a lot of things that that Josh uh, Tenenbaum has been uh, has been working on. I think. Um, whenever Josh and I have talked about this, and this goes back several years now, uh, or, or we've heard each other talk about this. I think one main difference that we had is that I think he's, he's still very much attached to the idea of generative models and very much attached to the idea of, uh, you know, latent variable models where you do Bayesian inference basically for both the latent variables and the, perhaps the parameters. And here I'm, I'm basically advocating to drop uh, two of those things, probabilistic modeling first, and then generative model second, you know, using those joint embedding. Uh, so I think, you know, I, I find it difficult to imagine a, a completely hierarchical uh, system that does not have the possible the ability to embed the 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 y variable the variable you're supposed to to uh, to predict or capture the dependency of, and most of the models I've seen from you know most uh, shops like people who use VAEs for example they 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 use generative models they predict y uh, they have a latent variable you know inside the VAE and I think a lot of the models that uh, Josh has been proposing are of this type now there's the question of uh, of uh, hierarchical planning. So there, there is certainly uh, several ways to do hierarchical plannings that, that people have proposed in the past, but they all rely on uh, basically hand-specified intermediate concepts for the, the planning, right? So a lot of planning in robotics basically, you know, uses hierarchical planning, but it's um, but the concepts that, in you know, the subtasks, the subgoals, the way you decompose the task into subtasks, all of this is basically hand-engineered. Uh, what I'm hoping a system like the one I proposed could do is basically learn the appropriate intermediate representations and sub goals. It may or may not work because, you know, as I told you, I haven't tried this uh, in its full fledged uh, form, uh, but that's what I'm shooting for. Thank you so much. Jesse? Uh, thanks, Jonathan. I, I really like this idea of not having decoders, uh, since in my field of particle physics, we have these extremely rich data sets, but we only care about a small number of features and the details don't often matter. And so it's really nice to think about things being summarized. Um, on the other hand, 
if we think about the way that the popular the imagination thinks about machine learning and its ability to, for example, generate photorealistic images, part of the trust, if you'd like, that AI is doing something interesting, at least powerful or, or somewhat human, is coming from its ability to do generative tasks. So, you know, if something like your your uh, hierarchical uh, Jeff is, is you know the direction that we're going, what does one show someone to say, hey, this is really doing the right thing? Is it just the sequence of actions? Is there something in the intermediate stages that one could look like? Is there something equivalent to kind of photorealism that one could talk about in order to kind of understand something about what the what the AI is doing? Yeah. Um... It's a very good question. So uh, th there's two issues there, okay? The first issue is uh, we don't actually have any good way of measuring the quality of a generative model, right? Uh, so all the papers that use, you know, GANs and other methods and diffusion models and stuff like that to generate photorealistic pictures, uh, you judge them subjectively by looking at the quality of the picture, but you don't really have a quantitative way of measuring how good a model of reality they are. Um, that, that's a major, you know, methodological issue, um, you know, which, you know, we don't solve very well. I mean, we use th things like, you know, inception score and st stuff like this that are kind of essentially ridiculous, right? I mean, we don't have any other way of doing it, so we're using it, but the sort of ridiculous ways of measuring the, the, the ability of a model to capture the, the output distribution. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, we're not doing a good job at this, okay? We don't have a good method to test generative models. Now, uh, so we have to use basically a downstream task to measure the, the quality of a, of, of a self-supervised model or some, some pre-trained model, um, which is what the, the people do in, uh, in computer vision these days. Now, the second thing is um, uh, GANs have been a complete bust when it comes to learning representations. There's been a lot of attempts at using GANs to learn good representations of images for classification, for example. And that basically has never worked. And it's very disappointing because I was a huge fan of GANs and I thought this would be the ticket, right? Um, and that's a complete bust. It, it turns out to just not, you know, they can produce nice pictures, but, um, but you can't use them to learn, to learn features or representations or to do predictions, okay? It's just not good. Um, now, there's a funny phenomenon here, which is that I'm, I'm watching the video of the room you're in and the camera keeps panning. <laughs> and, uh, and imagine that um, I, I need to predict what the, the image is going to look like as the camera pans, right? So <clears throat> there's some pictures on the wall here, and there's absolutely no way I can predict what those pictures look like before I see them, okay? There's some texture on the carpet. I, I can't even tell if there is carpet or not, but if there is carpet, there's probably some texture on the carpet. And uh, there's no way I could predict all the details of all the pixels of what's on the carpet because it's basically kind of random, more or less, right? I mean, the structure but it's basically random. So all of those are details that my uh, perception system and my prediction system will choose to ignore because I just cannot predict them. They're like the moving trees, uh, leaves in the trees. They're like the ripples on the pond. You know, there is some structure to it that I can predict, some texture maybe, but there is no way I can make a precise prediction of what, go what goes on. So I need my perception system to basically eliminate that for me. Um, or at least eliminate the details. That's the big advantage of the joint embedding uh, architectures. And you know, in physics, it's the same thing, right? There is a lot that you eliminate about the characteristics of a physical system um, that you allow yourself to not predict at all, like individual motion of molecules uh, in a gas, or, or you know, which is basically the majority of the information contained in a, uh, in a you know, volume of gas is the individual position and momentum of all the molecules. And you just choose to ignore this because you can't predict it. The only thing you, you keep is you know, pressure, volume, temperature, and number of uh, you know, mass. And that's about it, right? It's a tiny portion of the total amount of information. But it's the one that's predictable. So the future AI is the pictures aren't going to be as cool, but the predictions will be more robust. That's right. <laughs> And, and as a result, you will get abstract representations of this, right? I mean, it's sort of like, you know, you're predicting the trajectories of, uh, of planets. You don't need to know any detail about the nature of the planet. It's composition, you know, it's chemistry, blah, blah, blah. You don't even need to know its shape. You just need to basically just to know its mass and, you know, initial condition and you're done, right? So same story, like what are the relevant uh, characteristics that allow you to make predictions and which of all the, you know, quasi infinity of details should you ignore? That's the job of physicists do, right? I mean, when you model a model uh, a system, that's exactly what you do.
I thank you for the warming the heart of this physicist here. And I'll start. Prasanna. Um, so, so you mentioned training the encoder for the Y uh, by maximizing information. Now, uh, is it conceivable that at some level of uh, building this hierarchical model, maximizing information is not going to be aligned with having a representation that will be good for performing actions? Because yes. I can. It, it's not immediately obvious that they will stay aligned those two goals. So. You're right. Uh, You're absolutely right. So, uh, so there's two ways you can bias the representation towards things that may be relevant for future tasks, right? So first of all, you want to learn representations that are generic because you don't know what task you're going to be hit with. So, you know, you might want to learn representations in preparation for, uh, you know, learning a future task without knowing what what this future task will be. Um, so learn as much as you can about the world, right? With, without uh, it being directed at a task. But there's two ways you can bias the system. The first way you can bias the system is by basically choosing which type of architecture your encoders and your predictor uh, will use that will bias the system towards you know, understanding certain things and not others, right? So if you use a convolutional net for your encoder uh, with pooling, then the detailed position of you know, uh, a lot of objects will basically be eliminated and so, you know, there's only certain things your system will be able to learn because its perception system will, by default, eliminate a lot of information uh, that may or may not be irrelevant. So you can, you can bias this way, or you can bias also a second way by essentially having a, a decoding head uh, on the representation of Y or the predictive representation of Y that will attempt to predict things that is available in the world uh, or, or some cost function you can intrinsically compute if you want that... Uh, will sort of bias the system towards learning representations that contain that information. Okay, so it's, you know, think about this as like, you know, semi-supervised learning, right? You know, for some examples of X and Y, you have some, someone that tells you like, pay attention to this, right? Um, and uh, uh, for most of them, maybe not. And I think that would be sufficient. Uh, I had one other uh, thing. So uh, I agree that probabilistic uh, modeling uh, we may have reached the limits of that with engineering applications, but in science, sometimes like you're not trying to predict complicated stuff. You're trying to predict one number, for example, yeah. uh, and you want to predict it and you want to get proper error estimates on those numbers. And I think in yeah. those situations, we still have some place in the world for probabilistic modeling. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, you want to predict the mass of the Higgs boson, right? You're, you're going to have, like you heard Kyle Kramer, you know, <laughs> I think he gave a seminar in this series before me. And, uh, you know, there's a little blip in the curve at, you know, 137 GeV or whatever it is, right? And uh, sure, you want calibrated. Uh, so the main reason why you want probabilistic modeling is that probabilistic modeling gives you calibrated scores in such a way that if you have separate models that are independently built to produce likelihoods and, and, and calibrated probabilities, you can then combine them by computing, you know, products of probabilities or sum of probabilities, you know, appropriately combining them uh, so you get scores. Now, in a learning system that uh, is trained end to end, you don't need the system to manipulate probabilities internally uh, because the system is going to be trained end to end. So whatever variable it manipulates inside, you know, are, are going to be self calibrated, if you want. Um, and then the question is, do you need a distribution to make predictions on the output? And the answer is almost always no, unless the output of the system is an input to another system like a human that will make decision based on that, like, I don't know, uh, medical diagnosis or something. If your system is, uh, let's say a self-driving car, the fact that your self-driving car decides to turn left with probability 0.9 and turn right with probability 0.1 is completely irrelevant. It's just gonna turn left, right? It has to make a decision. Um, so, uh, so there, you need scores. You need the relative scores to be to be correct, but you don't care if those scores are calibrated probabilities, right? Uh, so, so in that sense, um, and and you know, again, uh, you know, thermodynamic. I mean, statistical physics basically taught us that, right? That the, you know, you can, you know, you, you the, the proper way to define the distribution is by you know a normalized exponential of uh, negative energy. So, and if you have you know multiple energies. You don't normalize them individually. You just sum the energies and you normalize the whole thing. Uh, 
thanks for the good talk. It was really interesting. I'll take one more question from Carlos. Um, I, I have a question that is somewhat unrelated, but um, almost at the end, you had an image that had, so in my understanding, you're going to use energy models to learn, to learn a representation of the world. So, but then in that image, you had an actor and a critic. So what, in your vision, what, um, what are you gonna use to create the actor and the critic? Like, is that going to be a reinforce, reinforcement learning algorithm or? No, so the, the, the critic is the trainable part of the cost function. So uh, at the beginning of the talk, I explained that you can train this uh, module by uh, essentially kind of memorizing the you know, states from the past together with, I mean, basically a past state uh, and then feed that to the, the critic and then train the critic to predict the future value of the intrinsic cost. So the critic becomes a long-term predictor of future values of the intrinsic cost. Okay, so the intrinsic cost would represent things like pain and pleasure, and you know whether you get burned or your batteries are dead or something, right? Uh, things that are sort of immediate. Uh, and then the critic would would say something like, you know, I'm facing a a long uh, uphill uh, track. You know, I'm a robot and my battery is almost uh, almost dead. Uh, I'm never going to get to the top, right? And my, my critic can predict I'm never going to get to the top because, you know, I've, I've, I've had this experience before of trying to climb something and emptying my batteries. So, um, so that's, you know, that's basically uh, uh, the, the role of the, of the critic there. So it's trained by supervised learning, by basically storing a history of sequences of states and then uh, training the, the critic to predict future values of the intrinsic cost. Now, the actor... Uh, is not connected with reinforcement learning, but more connected with optimal control. The, the, the way the actor decides on the sequence of actions is by using the word model to predict what's gonna happen in the future and then uh, computing costs of uh, the you know, state of the world that are predicted. And then by you know, gradient descent or, or some other you know, dynamic programming or something, uh, figuring out the sequence of actions that minimize the cost uh, given the, the prediction. So that's more akin to optimal control than it is to reinforcement learning. Okay, I actually never mentioned reinforcement learning uh, in the context of this model that I talked about here. So with this, let's thank Jan again for a very enlightening talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. I hope we will be able to have you in person in the future. Yeah, hopefully. All right, take care, everyone.